When I was six years old and living in Florida, my Aunt Dot went to England as a nurse uh, during World War II. Before she left, she promised to bring me back a machine gun, uh, and I was bitterly disappointed when she came home without it. She swears to this day that she had the gun, uh, but they took it away from her when she went to get on board the ship. I might be a little older now, but not much has changed. I still enjoy machine guns, and I know that thousands of others out there do too. What you're about to see is the fun, the history, and some straight talk about one of the most misunderstood pieces of engineering in America. We'll be showing and shooting the widest array of machine guns ever assembled, from the oldest to the very latest. We'll talk about some of the developments in engineering, the mistakes, twists, and turns the gun has taken. If you've never shot a machine gun, or even if you have, we think you're about to embark on a fascinating journey that will include a grand finale worth waiting for. You probably first heard about the machine gun through comic books or the movies. It replaced the six-shooter as the entertainment gun of choice as we shifted from the days of the Old West to World War II. If anything, the machine gun has gained in popularity during the last few years, with the help of people like Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger. In 1991, it's been pretty, pretty good, really. We're doing uh, Terminator 2, uh, which is a fairly big picture. We've done Iron Eagle 3, I guess it is, called Aces Eagles. Uh, there's a lot of gun gunfire in a lot of the movies that are going on right now. So we've been real busy. This particular piece right here was designed by the motion picture company itself for, for uh, Terminator 2. We told them what type of gun to use in it so that it would be a workable prop. And it is a calico inside of it. We're always looking to do something that is different. Each individual that comes in, not all the time, but most of the time, wants something that, that looks different. Nobody else has seen it and they want it to be, they want to be the only ones that have it. And uh, so we try to do our best to make something that, that is different. This is called a Hawk, uh, it's actually a tear gas gun, police tear gas gun. And uh, it was used in the latest Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger uses this in the movie, and it's a rotating 12-barreled 37-millimeter tear gas gun. And we had huge flash blanks for it, and uh, it, it should look pretty good. In the beginning, probably, uh, most of the things that were done early in the, in the motion picture industry were westerns. There were a lot of early westerns uh, that were done, so there were a lot of western-type guns. Um, then after World War I, of course, then they started into more of the, of the, the war movie type situations. Richard J. Gatling was an inventor of industrial and farm and agricultural machinery uh, prior to the days of the Civil War. He had it as, as his personal friends, uh, Abraham Lincoln for one, and a man by the name of Harrison, who was later to become the president of the United States, as well as Lincoln. Um, he was a great inventor and liked to, uh, to put pieces of machinery together and try to come up with a gun. And the Civil War offered an opportunity for Dr. Gatling to produce a weapon uh, that, that he felt he could sell to the government to increase the ability of firepower. The military was not prone to adopt the Gatling gun at all, and so it had very limited use in the Civil War. There were 12 purchased by the United States Ordinance uh, for $1,000 a piece. And it wasn't until after the Civil War and the problems out west with the Western expansion and the need for additional firepower with Indians that um, the Gatling gun was indeed perfected. Uh, even so, these guns, about 300 pounds each, still had a lot of problems in the field. They're not very mobile. 
They were normally operated in a bank of six to a battery. Six guns firing in an oscillating mood like this would put out a horrendous field of fire and uh, no human being or animal would, were able to get through this fire and this is where it became a very effective weapon. One of the problems with any weapon that has a repeated fire system is the cooling of the barrel. Gatling's system involves a center core right down the middle of this gun. You can't see it very well on the camera, but there is a pad of material, and you had to continually put water on this pad if the gun was going to remain in full operation. Many an unfamiliar Army Ordnance Sergeant would receive this gun from the ordnance department and they would proceed to rip this material out of there thinking it was part of the packing material when in fact it was the only built-in cooling system that the gun had. Dr. Gatling's gun was equipped with a broken bolt extractor which was the primary part of the gun that would malfunction or break during sustained firing. First of all you had to figure out which barrel number 1 through 10 was the problem and you'd line the gun up using the crank and then proceed to use this bolt extractor to extract the bolt and you could pull it right out of the gun and insert the new bolt, put the extractor back in and the, and the gun was back up to battery again for firing. Following the Civil War, the United States Army was stepped down quite a bit and the only useful purpose of the Army was for the western expansion of this country and the protection of the settlers and so they were put into full use against the Indians. One of the problems that faced General Custer as he moved west to battle the Indians was the fact that he needed to move quickly and he felt that the Gatling guns would slow his movement down so much that he felt uh, that he wasn't going to take them so he left them home in the garrison. Uh, had he have been able to take the Gatling guns with him and uh, perhaps moved at a slower pace things that the Battle of Little Bighorn might have been quite a bit different. If necessity is the mother of invention, then war is the mother of machine gun development. This is a Vickers machine gun, a medium machine gun. It's water-cooled. Uh, this particular specimen is chambered for the 303 British cartridge, although this gun has been chambered for many cartridges through its long lifespan, including most recently in 762 NATO, <clears throat> when it was employed by the South African Defense Force. In fact, uh, this gun is painted uh, in the colors used in, in South Africa. However, more significantly, it's a classic example of the type of machine gun that was employed and that dominated the trench warfare of World War I, since that's from whence it dates. This is the model 1912. It is uh, water-cooled, belt-fed from the right side, and recoil-operated. Here we see a fold-down anti-aircraft sight, uh, and here is a dial sight. The significance of the dial sight is <clears throat> that it was used basically for indirect fire, that is to say firing from defilade, uh, and it dates back to the days when machine gunnery was, was a science uh, closely associated with and actually coming out of artillery. To load the weapon, you take the, uh, the tab on the cloth cotton belt, insert it into the feed block, pull it firmly over as far as it will go, take the cocking handle, and pull the cocking handle while at the same time pulling on the belt, thusly. That has pulled a cartridge from the belt and placed it in the position for feeding into the chamber so that we must cock it one more time 
to actually drive around into the chamber. The gun is now loaded and ready to fire. Now we come to what you first probably saw when you heard the word machine gun. It's said that the Thompson is the gun that first made the 20s roar. Probably the most famous machine gun that was ever built. It was designed uh, shortly uh, before the end of the First World War. They called it a trench broom because the idea was that you could sweep the trenches clean of enemy opposition. It became more famous during the Depression years of prohibition in the hands of uh, famous gangsters, people like uh, John Dillinger and uh, Pretty Boy Floyd and uh, Babyface Nelson. And you've heard about the Valentine's Day Massacre, not to mention Dick Tracy, who all uh, were famous in real life or in fiction using this firearm. It's heavy, it's not much good for anything like hunting, but it's very popular with collectors. It's expensive to shoot, expensive to own, and although it was famous for being part of crimes, today it's one of the safest, uh, most legal, legally owned guns, guns that the owners are very careful about registration of and in fact Crimes with legally registered machine guns have been almost non-existent since 1934. But they're beautiful weapons. Uh, it's easy to appreciate the artistry that goes into building something like this. This particular model is a 1921 Thompson that was reissued in 1928 for the U.S. Navy, and it's called a 1928 Navy Overstamp. It fires either from a clip magazine, like this, which carries 20 rounds, or a drum like this, which carries 50 rounds. And there are other options as well. classic Browning automatic rifle, or BAR, been popular in two wars. Uh, it was also famous as the weapon that was used by the real Bonnie and Clyde bank robbers back in the 30s. But as you can see, it's a heavy, difficult weapon to handle. And so most of the time in the movies, they don't use the real BAR. They use some other lighter weight machine gun because as uh, we'll see here when we hand it to Kim, this thing is pretty hard to manage. All right, Kim, here's a real gun for you to try. You've got to be kidding. a rather slow rate of fire, but it's been very popular among American Army forces in ground wars starting back in World War I and World War II. It's very dependable, very accurate, 
and easy to maintain. It had some faults. The magazine feeds from underneath, which meant that it was a little bit difficult to manage in a prone position. But the men who used it generally loved it. Russians were working on their own version of the machine gun. This one is still used in communist countries today, the RPD. Well, I have a collection of about 50 or 60 uh, automatic weapons. Uh, this particular firearm is important in the history of automatic uh, weapons because it's the uh, squad automatic weapon for almost every communist bloc country over about the last 30 or 40 years. It's called the RPD a Russian design which uh, has also been copied by the Chinese and distributed to most every communist bloc country. Only recently it's been replaced by the RPK which is a magazine fed squad automatic uh, using the 7.62x39 cartridge. Um, the benefits on this particular squad automatic is number one it's light and quite portable as squad automatics go. It fills about the same niche as the M60 does, uh, but with much less weight. Uh, it's also extremely reliable, functions uh, under the most adverse conditions. Uh, probably if it has any drawbacks as a squad automatic weapon, it would be that it does not have an interchangeable barrel, and so barrel heating can become a problem uh, during extended firing. The uh, firearm is magazine fed through this drum and a uh, coiled belt is contained inside. It's actually a drum type belt carrier. Uh, the 7.62x39 cartridge is linked in a belt that uh, is non-disintegrating. In other words, there are 25 cartridges per belt segment and it feeds up out of the drum type belt carrier through the uh, firearm. This particular firearm is a British Bryn light machine gun. Originally used in 19, originally designed in 1936. It was used by the British forces and Commonwealth forces throughout World War II and has soldiered on even in today's armies in the form of the L2. The Bryn gun is chambered in caliber 303 British. Though the caliber itself offers a rather hefty kick, the weight of the gun offsets it. As we look at the Vietnam era, here's one of the more unique guns used, the stoner. This is a very unique weapon. It's actually a weapon system. Uh, Eugene Stoner designed it so that you could, in the field, by changing the components of this particular gun, turn it into a lot of different weapons. E everything from a carbine to a light machine gun, which is its present configuration. Right now, we're using a 150 round drum. It also has a box magazine that holds 100 rounds. Uh, cyclic rate on this particular gun is about 600 to 800 rounds per minute depending upon the gas setting that you're using and the particular ammunition that you're using. Um, it's a pretty nice little, little gun as you can see, easy to carry, easy to hold. It was tested by the U.S. Army in the 1960s as the XM207, but it was never really adopted by anyone except for the Navy SEALs who used it in Vietnam and uh, they used the designation the Mark 23 when they were using it. It's uh, easy to carry, fairly reliable gun, 
and a pretty rare collector's item. I guess the reason, one of the reasons I like this particular gun is as you can see, it's very convenient to hold, to carry, to shoot. Uh, if you want, you can use a bipod with it or it can be tripod mounted. Um, this little thing, however, is a very expensive investment. We've got about $10,000 in this particular uh, gun and the accessories that go with it. The stoner uses uh, 223 caliber ammunition and uh, let's take it out for a test drive. Whoa. Developments still continue with modern day guns such as the Minami. This is a Minami. It's a real ladies gun. Uh, it doesn't weigh off a lot. It's kind of short. It's really easy to handle. Uh, quick change barrel makes it, uh, you know, basically a really easy thing to shoot. Uh, it takes both uh, linked ammo and magazine. And, uh, the links are disintegrating links also. Um, it's an awful lot of fun to shoot too. Actually, it doesn't have much of a history. It's still fairly new. It's, um, only about 10 years old. It goes back to uh, a development drive out of Belgium looking for something that would compete with some of the heavier rifles of this class. Some of the other countries throughout the world are also looking at it, so it uh, has a fair amount of uh, wide use to it. I like it because it uh, doesn't kick a lot. It, uh, it's easy to handle. Uh, I can either sit down and use it this way or I can fold this up and shoot it like a rifle, uh, as it is and indeed a rifle. Uh, because it takes a 223, it doesn't have a lot of kick. It's also um, a fairly light cartridge, so I can carry more out with me, and it's not as heavy and bulky as some other cartridges. And it uh, also keeps the cost down, uh, the cost of the uh, feeding it. It's really uh, uh, you know, less expensive and just a lot of fun to go out and shoot, a real pleasure. Uh, tonight we have some Tracer here, and you get to kind of see it arc out. It's really quite pretty. Probably the most awesome piece of ground firepower in World War II was the quad 50 caliber anti-aircraft mount. The mount carried four Browning AM2 heavy barrel 50 calibers, 550 rounds per gun per minute, total rate of fire 2,200 rounds per minute. The mount is electrically powered in both traverse and elevation, it contains its own generator, battery. All the four guns, of course, were electrically fired through solenoids. They're retrofitted to have either the solenoid on the buffer or the solenoid up on top. The mount was very effective against moving targets and aircraft. Uh, against stationary targets on the ground, as it was used in Korea, the mount was very difficult to use in that no matter where you put the controls, the mount always wanders just a little bit. So instead of sighting in precisely on a target and squeezing off a few rounds, the gunner simply locked down and fired long bursts while doing kind of figure eights through the target. With Tracer and Incendiary, it was really impressive. Gun has an optical sight, just like an aircraft does. So as you look through the sight, it, it projects a pipper off to infinity, so it makes a single point for the gunner to shoot at. Most of the pictures you see of the guns as used in Korea had the standard 100 round boxes, which were much easier to handle. This gun in civilian hands probably is the, uh, the ultimate in firepower of anything available.
This is a McDonnell Douglas uh, 7.62 chain gun, originally designed for the Bradley fighting vehicle. Uh, the gun is electrically powered, chain driven. The chain gun represents one of the most modern designs in machine guns. Later on tonight, we'll be shooting this one. In the meantime, let's go over to McDonnell Douglas's plant and talk to them about some of their larger chain guns. Uh, this is the 25 millimeter Bushmaster that we're producing for the uh, U.S. Army and, and also the Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and all foreign sales. Uh, we've produced over 7,300 of these weapons so far, starting in 1981 was our first production uh, startup. Uh, very simple gun, the chain gun. Uh, all chain guns are the same, motor driven not gas operated so you don't have to worry all the gas goes out the barrel not in the cockpit or the turret of the vehicle there's three different modes of firing the chain gun 25 millimeter one is single shot another is low rate of 100 that's selectable by the gunner or high rate of 200 okay. there is another version with a small major change to the motor and gears and that's in the high rate system for the marine LAV system that's 500 shots per minute Well, it was designed by a person in Hughes Tool Company, uh, where he started with the company back in 1947, named Leonard Price. Uh, used to work on the flying boat, and one of the old designers. And uh, he always had a thing in his mind that before he left the company, he'd like to take something from the motorcycles that he used to ride a lot and use it into a gun concept. And he got this idea of a chain gun and got the permission from my boss, Mike Clary, to uh, draw it up and, and uh, try one. So he did. He got the approval. And uh, it worked. And uh, we've been building them ever since. What are the similarities between this gun and the one you use on the Apache? Uh, the 25 millimeter chain gun, and actually all chain guns, including the Apache gun, are very similar in that they all are motor driven, all are chain driven, uh, bolt carrier bolt, almost identical to the weapon system we have on the Apache, the M230 weapon system. This weapon system here, the M242 25 millimeter cannon is used on the Bradley fighting vehicle. The 30 millimeter M230 used on the Apache is very, very similar. This happened to be percussion uh, fired round of ammunition, the Apache being electric prime. That's basically about the only difference in the weapons. The history of the machine gun is really a circle. It starts with the Gatling gun, goes through the Hotchkiss and the Maxims and the Brownings, uh, through the Stoners, and then comes full circle back to the Gatling gun. 7.62, shoots 6,000 rounds a minute out of six barrels. It's the baby brother of the 20 millimeter cannon that's found in all of today's modern Air Force fighters. In civilian hands, the, the minigun is a fairly rare piece. There can't be more than, oh, maybe 20 that are, that are possessed by civilian dealers. Uh, it's an exotic gun. It's hard to maintain in civilian hands, but it's a, it's a fascinating gun because of all the mechanical parts that, that, that have to function in time for it to operate. It's electrically driven, uh, belt fed, and this particular mount, we have it fed out of a thousand round magazine, which is only good for about 20 seconds of fire. We've shown you a variety of machine guns, but for a little more of the history, let's go over to Doug Champlin's Fighter Museum in Mesa, Arizona. Doug, you were telling us about a, a Japanese World War II machine gun in here that has quite a bit of history behind it. 
the uh, first Marine Division captured this gun at Guadalcanal, and uh, uh, General Vandergrift, who was the commanding officer of the first Marine Division, uh, presented it to Admiral Halsey as a trophy when uh, his division uh, overran the Bloody Ridge at Guadalcanal and captured this gun. And Admiral Halsey then gave it to his flag secretary, uh, Rear Admiral Nickel, and uh, we uh, procured it from Rear Admiral Nickel. So this gun really uh, saw action, and it was really at uh, Guadalcanal, and in fact, uh, our armorer, Chris Laris, was uh, telling us a little earlier that uh, when he cleaned this gun here last year for the first time, uh, there was still some red sand uh, in the gun from, from Guadalcanal. Doug, if you had to pick one gun in here that, as your favorite, or, or the one that you had the warmest feeling towards, uh, what gun would it be? Probably the Minus Thompson machine gun was the only uh, a Thompson that was engraved by Colt. It's a beautiful, beautiful gun, and it's probably the most valuable. On the other hand, um, the gun that I think that is very interesting engineering-wise is the FG-42, the German uh, paratrooper uh, gun. And it was a, uh, it bridged that gap between the submachine gun and the assault rifle. Doug, in going through your museum here, I see you have one of the first uh, submachine guns ever made. The Villa Perosa, the Italian gun that we have over 1914, was the first submachine gun. And so, uh, again, a very landmark uh, piece of equipment. I had some reservations about putting the guns in a museum because, unfortunately, the the uh, the media has been a little uh, harsh on, on gun owners and, and and I think quite unfairly on the machine gun owners because uh, there's never been a, a crime uh, that I know of uh, on record that it was ever committed with a registered machine gun and, and so uh, I think uh, we've been unfairly picked on but uh, I, I didn't know what uh, the public reaction would be to having uh, guns here. But it's been very good, and so people that come in here that, that enjoy high-performance equipment, I think they do appreciate high-performance equipment of other sorts and other types, and they do appreciate the, the engineering and the, and the craftsmanship that go into to the guns and seeing the evolution of the, of the machine gun, too. Doug, if, if someone comes through your museum and is, is fascinated by the machine guns and, and decides they want to own one, what do they have to go through to do that? Well, the procedure is really uh, a lot simpler than most people think, and essentially it, uh, you can get the proper forms from either uh, your gun dealer or you can get them directly from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms of the Treasury Department, which are in, listed in your yellow pages on the federal government. Essentially then uh, you have to be fingerprinted by your, your local law enforcement agency. Uh, that goes on the form. Also, your photograph. The third requirement is a endorsement from a law enforcement uh, officer. It can be uh, attorney general for the your state or county or district attorney. It doesn't have to be the police chief, but it could be a sheriff. Anybody that can attest to your character, and uh, he just uh, has to uh, authorize uh, that you're of good character and can own a gun. So if you meet those three requirements, and in about six months, uh, uh, you'll have your gun. The, um, uh, the only uh, financial burden is if you buy a live gun and you want to shoot it, there's a $200 transfer tax per gun that the uh, customer has to pay. If the gun's deactivated and will not fire, and, uh, uh, then there is no uh, tax whatsoever. No one's suggesting that machine guns are for everyone any more than a Formula One race car is for everyone. They're exotic pieces of machinery. They're expensive to buy and expensive to shoot. The least expensive belt-fed machine gun will cost $3,000, whereas an exotic piece like a minigun may go for as much as $30,000. Machine guns are clearly the best behaved of all classes of firearms. How well behaved are they? Federal firearms agent Jack Killeran told us, quote, since 1934, there has been an insignificant number of machine guns used in crime. It doesn't amount to a handful, unquote. You would think this kind of record would satisfy those who favor more gun regulation, but it doesn't. Despite the evidence, even more restrictions were added in 1986. The Firearm Owners Protection Act states, no machine gun made after May 18, 1986 can be sold to a private citizen. 
That cuts out citizen ownership of new guns made in the future. All this regulation, by the way, when regulators admit criminals don't even want machine guns. Again, in our conversation with Jack Killeran of the ATF, he says what most law enforcement people will also admit, quote, it's not the gun of choice of crime. Most criminals want a handgun, something they can conceal, unquote. It's very important in dealing with any kind of firearm that safety come first. The same is true of machine guns. With the right kind of precautions, they can be a lot of fun. And people enjoy shooting them in different spots all around the country. Shooting exotic weapons at moving targets is a lot of fun, but the first thing we had to do was figure out a place we could do it safely. Uh, it took us uh, the better part of five years to find a place that was this open. This is an area where there is really not even a dirt road to give access uh, uh, to our shooting area back here. Downrange, we have almost seven miles of uh, clear uh, terrain that's bordered by the mountains. Even at that, it would be possible for a hiker to come in. So before we ever start to shoot and before the sun goes down and we can really uh, secure the area, we uh, fly the whole thing low level with the helicopter. We strongly advise against anyone else doing this sort of shooting unless they have taken the same precautions we have. There, there are very few places in the United States that offers this sort of depth of range to allow you to do this safely. Now we come to what I think is the, is the high point of our program, the, the smoke and thunder part. For years, we've tried to find a target that would, that would match the destructive power of our machine guns. We tried old cars. Uh, we set them out there and they'd just sort of soak up the bullets. They'd just lay there. The hoods wouldn't fly off and they didn't blow up like in the movies. So we tried barrels of explosive and magnesium and, and they burned real neat, but there was still no action to them. So we have now come up with what I think may well be the perfect machine gun target.
these are the destroyers, each with a belly full of bombs, and 10 men, like the crew of the Memphis Bell. Pilot Capru, 10,000, put on oxygen. They're climbing higher now, 300 feet a minute. The strain on the planes and on the men is mounting. They're higher and colder. Temperature, 40 degrees below zero. Take off your glove and you lose some fingers. You look out at the strange world beyond, reflections in plexiglass, like nothing you ever saw before, outside of a dream. Higher and higher into the lifeless stratosphere, until the exhaust of the engines mixing with the cold, thin air condenses and streams the heavens with vapor trails. They're far from beautiful, for they point like beckoning fingers to the formation. Signposts in the sky for the enemy to spot us. Here's the first. This is a Thunderbolt base in East Anglia on the east coast of England. One of many such bases from which our fighter planes swarmed up into the far red yonder of battle to the east. Day after day, month after month. Mustang, Thunderbolt, Lightning against the ME-109s and the FW-190s. Our fighters attacked, attacked, attacked. Two into ten, six into fifty. They broke up the enemy's mass assaults. Then his shattered flights were pounced upon and destroyed individually. Our victory column soared at the rate of four to one. Great and gallant days they were. Many new aces, many empty places. Victory, victory, death, victory, victory. open season on this kind of sitting duck. Watch this boy reef it around for another crack. No train in daylight hours was safe. No marshalling yard a haven. The enemy's desperately needed rail transport system was shattered all over the map.
I'm going to share with you some techniques that have helped me over the years. Some may work, some may not but they should make you a better and safer shooter. The action shooting sport has grown rapidly over the past 10 or 12 years. This growth was led by California and Arizona, where men like Jeff Cooper, Jack Weaver, Ray Chapman, Thel Reed Jr., Eldon Carl and Terry Allison envisioned pistol competition that featured action scenarios. Targets instead of round bullseyes would be armed adversaries, often more than one. Time required to hit the target was as important as accuracy. They called this new type of competition practical or combat pistol shooting. The term combat has since been dropped for the more innocuous titles of action or IPSC shooting. IPSC stands for International Practical Shooting Confederation. Today, IPSC matches are held all over the world, involving shooters who believe in the sport and the safety and professionalism surrounding it. 